My story today is involving the story of how USONA, a relatively new nonprofit drug development company, came into existence, why it did, what we're up to with both our first initial clinical trials for depression and the other activities that we're doing that we hope can contribute to bringing the field forward, transforming the field. The part that isn't up there on the slides, um, but that I wanted to share because it, it helps me tell my part of the why, is that I came from a world where my job would have been and my ideal job would have continued to be um, a doctor, an integrative medicine physician, family physician in Kim's Hospital, wherever that is, the ideal hospital. Um, of the future with truly an integrative approach going on. And as I was reading the talks coming up and listening to the last ones, I was thinking, well, I really got my start in the 1990s when I was doing, um, I was working with Dean Ornish on a comprehensive lifestyle uh, plan for people with heart disease. And there we were taking people with cardiac disease lots of them type A business people, putting them in a room, making them participate in group support, teaching them meditation and yoga, and asking them to exercise together. And I think for many of them, that was an altered state enough. But we got these, <laughs> these massive effects, these changes in the, the clogging of their arteries and differences in self-care, empathy, all of these things. So now, I've come into a role where we're adding psychedelics and hoping to, hoping to study the full integrative context. So I was doing that work six years ago, and incidentally, through colleagues, I met a family that had had a multi-generational experience with a Peruvian shaman. They had gone because of one of the family members' mental illness, and this family, multi-generational, had been transformed. And it just had my attention as I was listening to the patriarch of the family in his 70s say, I am a kinder person. I like people better now, not to mention what it's done for another member of my family. At about the same time, a colleague of mine from back in Madison, Wisconsin, where I had done my, my medical training and earlier academics had said, I need to introduce you to this man, Bill Linton. He's the CEO of a life sciences company in Madison, Wisconsin, and he's extremely interested in funding research, high quality, rigorous research into psychedelics. And by the way, his company has quite progressive policies on wellness for all of its many hundred employees um, back then just in Madison. So I thought, well, all right, it must be time. I guess I need to have this conversation. And so when we met and um, I learned Bill's story, um, which essentially was that Bill had had a very close friend and neighbor who was a hospice nurse. And she had developed breast cancer, it was treated, she got better, but when it came back, her level of depression was just flooring, and none of the traditional treatments were helping her. And despite the fact that she was a hospice nurse, in some way was prepared, she was just devastated by the depression. Bill thought that he remembered from some decades earlier that there had been some interesting research into LSD, maybe psilocybin. He started to look on the internet, and his search led him to Roland Griffith's study with people with cancer. And so Bill called Roland, asked if he could meet him, and was really impressed, asked Roland, you know, what would be your next study? Do you know what you would next most want to study? And Roland had an immediate answer, and Bill just said, this is, this is impressive, and if I could, I'd like to get my friend, I'd like to see if she qualifies for your study. She did, she went through the study, and although she lived only four or five more months beyond it, all who knew her said she had a transformed experience. Um, one in which she was able to connect and communicate with friends, accept death more. And so, 
Bill became a funder through Hefter, um, through the Hefter Research Organization and its scientists, and then became a board member. And just about the time he and I had this conversation um, about his perhaps wanting to start a research organization, it was starting to become clear that something, an entity was going to be needed that could take the host of academic studies that were being developed at that time. We had the studies from Johns Hopkins and NYU, um, some completed, some underway. UCLA had done research. There was the whole body of European research um, underway. But it was academic. There was not a drug sponsor um, there to bring that forward. And so Bill recognized that gap um, and began to say, maybe I, with my, my background in life sciences and running a company and some interaction with the FDA, could build an entity um, that could begin to produce psilocybin and run trials. So when he asked me on the day that I met him what I would most like to be doing in life, I said, well, I would like to be doing exactly what I'm doing now, seeing patients in an integrative way with enough time to do it fully. I'd like to have a hand in research. I had done a research fellowship, but I knew about myself I wasn't a primary researcher. I wasn't going to be the PI, but I wanted to be able to support in some way. And then I said, do you really want to know everything I'd like to do? And he said, yes. I said, well, there needs to be a retreat center somewhere where politicians and teachers and community advocates and people who have their finger on the pressing complex social problems that face us can have a transformational experience and begin to think and act differently about that. And so Bill got a little twinkle in his eye and he said, I think I know a place where you can do that. And within a few months, um, I had moved myself from here in New York back to Madison and we were starting the idea of this nonprofit USONA. Now, interestingly, a little bit embarrassingly, um, leading up to the point that we are now, but it was just an honest story of learning, um, we started working with our Hefter colleagues, Hefter scientists, um, to think about what study we would propose. And when we first placed an application in to the FDA, we placed it into the track that we knew, which was the same track that all of the academic researchers had put in their applications for. And the, the FDA sort of politely got back to us and said, um, excuse us, but aren't you intending to produce psilocybin um, like a drug sponsor? And we said, yes, in fact, we are. And they said, well, this is a whole different path. The commercial, you know, the quote commercial, even though you're a nonprofit path, is a, a different pathway with different approval bars. And so we withdrew our application and started again to learn about that commercial pathway. And so one of the things that became clear and has strongly influenced our path and our timing is that if you are a commercial sponsor, you cannot just say to the FDA, we're ready to do our study. This is our study plan, our protocol, which, you know, with your approval, will start. You have to have the chemistry line, the development of the drug, ready enough in parallel to go and have the FDA's confidence that that process has been validated and um, you're set with supply, adequate supply and a process to reproduce that. So, um, after a humbling and learning experience of, you know, our initial prediction that, oh, we'll, we'll be starting a phase three study, perhaps in three years, we're now five years out and we are confidently and enthusiastically ready to begin our phase two study of, of psilocybin for people, adults with major depression. But it's been such a learning and our chemistry product is ready and so I'd like to tell you a little bit more about both of those paths that we're working on.
So some of these points I've told you, USONA is an entity called a medical research organization. It's a special kind of 501c3 nonprofit that um, unlike a foundation, which can exist through funding other research solely, there's a mandate for an MRO to be actively involved in engaging in its own research. Um, we can also fund others, but a certain percentage of our work has to go to our own, and we have to do it in tandem with a public hospital, a not private hospital. You can have more than one, but you have to have one named partner. Ours is the University of Wisconsin Hospital in Madison, Wisconsin, plus the many other um, collaborators that we'll get to in a moment. We, as I said, we're mandated as a public entity to serve the public good, um, and we we brought ourselves into existence to bridge the gap between the academic studies and the process to gaining a, a new drug approval, an NDA, from the FDA. This is a very incomplete list of our collaborators. I, our director of operations recently told me we're up to 45, but I wanted to put this slide up and highlight a few of the organizations who really shared knowledge with us, collaborated with us on early proposals, and now are becoming active participants in the depression study. So if I do that, my doodle on this slide looks like this. Um, so we really have to credit that early relationship with Hefter and its scientists for um, educating us about the field, sharing their phase two research and earlier some of it, um, and advising all the way along. Hefter had many uh, scientists at institutions that we've now actively begun to collaborate with. Some of the lines are there. Um, I'll get to naming them in particular when I get to the sites of, of our currently about to be launched study. Uh, we also collaborate, um, well, I just have to, I have to thank MAPS. At every turn of the road, MAPS has shared with us what they've learned through their approach to the FDA. They've been so transparent and helpful, so our applications would not be where they are without MAPS's ongoing input and help for us. Also, down at the bottom, CIIS, um, who's been out um, at the forefront of creating this official training in becoming a psychedelic therapist, um, both MAPS and CIIS gave great input um, into our own guide training. We call it facilitator training. I can get to the reason for that in a moment, but we really want to credit them. And then there's that near circle of academic institutions that all um, gave feedback on our, on our approach and study designs. Okay, I've gone over that we are a nonprofit. The biggest thing we hope to accomplish by being a nonprofit is that um, when FDA approval is gained, which we, we hope that the data will, will show us that that is the way to go, USONA, by being a nonprofit, doesn't have to return any investment money at all to investors or private equity. And so the cost um, can be much more minimal because to produce psilocybin itself, once you're at scale, is actually not such an expensive venture for just the medicine. There's a question of how much support, um, what will the cost be of the supports around it? Um, but still in all, by being a nonprofit, we hope to increase accessibility that way by keeping costs down. We've also committed to an open science model. And in essence, what that means is it's an agreement, a commitment that we've made that there have been many signers to this document in this room. It's an agreement to take research findings and get them into the public domain as quickly as possible um, so that other researchers, clinicians, institutions can use those data to produce better social and medical solutions more quickly. So that is that commitment. The CGMP aspect, um, 
This is terminology that refers to current good manufacturing process, uh, practice, material. Um, that's the name essentially for pharmaceutical grade psilocybin. And it just turns out that there is a world of difference between producing really, really pure psilocybin that can be utilized for most academic studies, um, at least as they used to be in the United States, and this pharmaceutical grade that has to go through this massively validated process. I've got a little graphic coming up later just to give you a sense of what that's like. Um, and finally, USONA has increasingly been acting as a convener of people in the field contributing through their data, through their um, policy expertise, and so on. So we have a few of our major um, events that we've hosted in the last few years listed there, but they have been around bringing the experts together and saying what studies need to be done next, how should they be done, um, and then some of these looking at what's the road ahead to effective delivery, what are the hurdles and the questions that we'll have to address. You know, USONA started as two people. We got our, our first employee, full-time employee, came in late um, 2015, and now we've got just over 20 employees. I am so grateful as a clinician with a good heart. Um, I, I used to tell Bill, you know, maybe my title at USONA should be Keeper of the Ethos, because I, I'm so glad that we now have these other people with the regulatory expertise, um, deeper expertise than I would have had in the, the drug development and so on. So that's our team of 20 plus um, working together. A little bit backing into why our choice to make a first trial that we're launching into in depression. Uh, as you know, as I just shared, our initial collaborations and interest were around the data that were being collected around people who had some, some had depression, many of them had anxious symptoms, but they all had cancer. So when we first were approaching the FDA, our intention was to do a pivotal trial, or two of them, in a cancer population, looking at people with depression who had cancer. And very interestingly, the FDA said to us, we are not convinced, no data exists yet, to say that depression in cancer is different than depression, period. So, of course, many will still have their opinions on this. There may well be some unique components that are unique to the end of life and that existentialist distress, but essentially the FDA was saying to us, as public servants, it is our duty to make sure that an effective medicine, a potentially effective medicine, would get to the widest audience possible. So, or not audience is the wrong word, but the, the widest group of medical need. And so, if you can show that this is effective in depression, that's the first study we'd like you to do, because if you show it's effective in depression, you automatically can get to the people who have cancer. Um, underneath it. So, so we stepped back, changed our proposal, and focused on depression. And when you look at that alone, of course, here are your whys. You know, depression has become an epidemic. It, it affects 300 million people worldwide. One out of six people in the United States will have an episode of depression in their lifetime. It's predicted by next year to be the second largest cause of medical morbidity around the globe. The economic burden in the US alone is 210 billion, depending on the way you count it. So lots of justification for this to be our first study focus. And because the current treatments fall so short, um, let me show you the graph about this on the next slide. So essentially, in the green, you have the percentage of people who take SSRIs and get better, get significantly enough better to be called in remission. The rest of the 67% continue to have moderate, um, severe, or very severe 
symptoms in those categories, or even the mild are counted in that 67. So new solutions are needed. And when you take a look at the way SSRIs look, it's a good news, bad news picture, right? If you look at this graph, down the, the bottom line on the red is people who get SSRIs who get better. Their depression symptoms go down. The green is people who get placebo, which speaks to those powerful results. Those placebo people get almost as better as the people who took the SSRIs and got better. But the problem is the line in blue. The line in blue up on top is the people who got SSRIs who don't get better. They actually stay worse than that group of people who got placebo. So there's such a reason um, to, to access a medicine that works in some of the ways that we've just heard about and will be hearing about. More bad news, so when antidepressants don't work, um, the things that we know about it is the more times a person fails an antidepressant, the less likely they are to be able to respond effectively to another future antidepressant. So, and the more times you fail, the higher your likelihood of early relapse and so on. The more bad news about when they do work, the problems when they work for a while, you get these couple of phenomenon very often, too often. The tardive dysphoria is the state where your depression is actually perpetuated and possibly worsened on the antidepressant. And these bottom two um, lines refer to this process whereby the brain eventually, um, with further time on antidepressants, and then when they're ended, the brain loses some of its protective functioning against depression and appears to actually get weakened in terms of its overall ability to recover and right itself. So, so are we doing harm and what would better solutions look like? Well, we've already had some descriptions about the way this would work. The, the reason I framed it up this way and, um, is to just highlight a little bit of the difference with the psychedelics. So in the bottom two circles, you've got the way drug development and, and study data were showing us that we would have been looking. So you're changing drugs by changing, um, trying to seek new biological mechanisms, which as we know hadn't happened for quite some time, at least within the traditional psychotropics. Um, but then, adding to that combined therapy, you've got all the psychotherapeutic approaches, but then the third circle points to this this whole new world that you know maybe the, the yogis knew about before, but it's new to medical science to be studying things like emotional breakthrough, mystical experience, peak experience. We think all of these circles um, are getting touched on by our approach with psilocybin. Of course, the fourth circle that's needed is the economic and social context. There needs to be enough drug delivered effectively and safely to as many people as possible without compromising safety. So these better solutions not only would change insights and behaviors, but they would create resilience in people. And that's what we're so hopeful about with the psilocybin, that the prior research that's been done, and I have a little listing of it um, that we can quickly flash on, but gives us a lot of hope that these one-time or few-time psychedelic treatments begin to build this inner resilience in people where they do more health-seeking behavior. They take better care of themselves, they attend their relationships, they feel better overall um, about their well-being path. This is just a, a, a listing of some of the most prominent effects in the already completed psilocybin studies that lead us to believe that we're really going to be able to tap into building resistance and resilience in people through giving them psychedelic therapy. Let me tell you a little bit about the specifics now um, of the trial that we're starting. Um, it's a phase two trial that is going to include seven sites, at least we're beginning with seven sites. Three of those sites um, have now been at, um, 
completed their training that they need to go through for all the facilitators and are going to be activated into their recruitment stages this month, which is super exciting. So on this list, um, we've now finally got all the contracts completed. We can say this, the sites are Johns Hopkins, NYU, UCSF, Yale, Madison, Great Lakes, um, which is a, a private research site in Chicago, and then another private SMO down in Miami called Siegel. The facilitator manual is done, or at least version three is done. We'll probably have 10 before the study is completed, but it's, it's out and available to be accessed. And we now have an active clinical trials website where people who are interested in submitting their names to be considered for a study can. And that, uh, that URL is right there. I just got the most recent update. More than 6,000 people have submitted their names um, as being interested in participating in a depression trial. Of course, those that come through all the filters um, to get into the study will be far fewer. But, And then to contribute to all of this and to contribute to the road of asking the question, what other substances beyond psilocybin need to be in our development pipeline? We have um, begun with two medicinal chemistry labs, one located in Madison, the other located in San Luis Obispo. You know, when the few of us said, how hard could this be? How hard could it be to get psilocybin produced in this acceptable way for pharma? This is a picture of what the drug manufacturing facility looks like. Um, absolutely incredible. And as I alluded to before, purity isn't the end game for the FDA. You can produce 99.9% .9 pure psilocybin and it won't be enough. It has to have this validated process where the, the pathway of development is done once, validated, go through, validate again, validate a third time, and you, know, you finally have your, your solid mechanism. So, all right, this I've talked about. This is a little bit more about the trial itself, just a few last details. This represents the very first time all of these criteria have happened at once in a trial. It's the first randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled study of a single dose of psilocybin in a general population that is otherwise medically healthy people with major depression. So we're excited about looking at what we find when all of those come together. This first phase is going to have 80 people. It'll have assessments of depression and the other secondary measures at one week and six weeks. Our approach is a very um, generalized, non-directive but supportive approach to being present with people through their day of dosing and the preparation and integration that goes into it. Um, we debated different ways. We debated doing a very specific psychotherapy when the FDA first expressed um, the mandate that we do a specific psychotherapy along with this trial. But ultimately, the FDA's final guidance to us was not to do a manualized psychotherapy. So we have, we have stepped back a little bit from it and have gone with the model um, that Johns Hopkins had started off with, a more non-directive but fully supportive presence that has a flexible way of meeting the participant where they are. And of course, because we're doing that, and the people who do it are so good, um, so good at supporting people in the trial that we're expecting large effects just from that part of the intervention alone. It's not just the psilocybin that's going to be active, but the, the other comparison study drug, um, which in our case is a very low dose of niacin. Those people who also get this supportive presence we expect they're gonna do very well because why wouldn't you? To, sit, to have all of this time to be listened to with your story and then come into a room where you have a beautiful playlist for eight hours or however many hours it takes you in the presence of these two guides is a powerful effect um, whether you got psilocybin or not. This is the last one. Um, we're really hoping that by doing this work we can make an impact um, on well-being and happiness and 
the functioning of this world. So thank you.